Father Lord, we thank you, we worship you. Ancient of days, we have come together again on this faithful Tuesday evening to exalt and to honor your name as we join together in fellowship with you in an open house at fellowship. In an open house fellowship, we ask that you come and be with us. Holy Spirit, no man can teach your word except you give it to him. Teach us the language we will understand. Make known to us the word of God. Instruct us on the path we should choose. Guide us with wisdom and lead us in the path that you have prepared for us. Guide us with understanding. As many that will come today, Lord, open their eyes to behold the things that are equal and their understanding to see what is right. Teach us what we should say. Guide us in your word. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today, my name is Missionary Collins. I will be your host today on Open Heart Fellowship with CGF. Today we are looking at the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Why did Jesus give us the Great Commission? Why is it essential in our Christian faith? Our text for today is taken from the book of Acts of Apostles, from chapter 1. Acts of Apostles, chapter 1, from verse 1. Jesus' last record was come to be known as the Great Commission. Ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utmost part of the earth. And the book of Acts written by Luke is a story of the man and woman who look who took that great commission seriously and began to spread the news of the risen Lord to the most remote corner of the known world. Each section of the book, like Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 7, 12 to 8 to 12, 13 to 28, focus on the particular audience, a key personality, and a significant phrase in the expansion of the gospel message. As the second volume in a two-part work by Luke, this book probably had no separate title, but all available Greek manuscripts trans designated it by the little phases act. The little phases of act. Act or by an expansion title like the Art of the Apostle. The phrases was commonly used in the Greek literature to summarize the accomplishments of the outstanding men, while the apostles are mentioned collectively at several points. The book really recorded the act of Peter and of Paul. The act of Peter from verse 1 to 12 and of Paul from 13 to 28. The former treatise, I read from verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, has given commandment unto the apostle whom he has chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proof, being seen of them forty days, and speaking to the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, ye have heard of me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from hence. Praise the Lord. Today we are looking at the Great Commission. And how does the Holy Spirit come into the Great Commission? Because without the Holy Spirit, the Great Commission is not possible. Witnessing might look so simple. But we tax the presence of the Holy Spirit. All our efforts and our attention to weakness will be vain. We try to witness as believers because that is what we do. But to really witness to the lost, you need the passion. And you need God's direction. And you need God's expatriate. Because no one can actually come to God except God himself draw him. And how are you going to know those whom God has drawn? And that is why you need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the key to weakness. And as a believer who is not empowered with the Holy Spirit can never be, an, be a believer that is thought of in weakness. For you to be able to witness and save the lost, you, don't, you need to know more than just knowing the scripture's text. You have to remember the scriptures you have written. You, for you to remember the scripture you have read, you need the Holy Spirit to bring those things to life in you. And you need the Holy Spirit to interpret these words to the hearer. And that's why you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not just the baptism, but also the fruits of the Spirit. Because without the fruit at work in you, your character cannot transform people. And that is why this topic, the Great Commission, is centered around the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is what enables us to witness. The Great Commission is split into different versions. We have first the Judea, our household, those within our village, those around our town. Then we have the Samaria those that are nearby cities and those that are in a town that doesn't speak the same language as we do but we also have another group the utmost parts of the earth those who culture are different those who does not stay within our continent those who does not speak the same language who cultures languages preference colors Speech are different from ours. These are also people that the Great Commission is meant for. So, for the Great Commission to be achieved in the life of a believer, first, you need a strategy. Because Christ had a strategy. You, as his follower, must have a strategy. To be able to carry out effectively the Great Commission, every believer must have a strategy. But today, what are your strategy to evangelize the old world? To witness to the lost? Because most of all felt when we talk about mission, we have to go to only the village where Loma is. Though that is part of mission, but there are also mission in the town. There are millions of confused people in the town who does not believe that God even exists and millions of others in the cities, inside the church, who go to church because they see that pastor can act drama, and they don't fully really believe the God he is speaking about. So how do you find these people that are inside the church, that are in the street corner, that are in the academic institution, that are in the pop house, some have already committed a lot of crime that the devil has reserved them in prison. Some are in the disco hall. Some are in religious gathering. More, some are even in Bible school. Not knowing what they are doing there. So how do you take the gospel to these people? Who may seem to be in a place where the gospel is being preached but they are actually lost? That is where the Great Commission gets complex. And beyond just taking the gospel to them in form of sermon, 
we need to train them. The Bible makes it clear to us that not only will we hear the gospel, but we should also train the people. But how do you not train people who know better than you? How do you bring people into training who are more educated, more complex, and live in a different world entirely different from your own? That is where the Great Commission gets interesting. What about people who are hunting from church to church, looking to see miracles? How do you bring the gospel to them? Since they are not interested in hearing about Christ, all they care about is the work he can do. So, there are also people of that class. So, the Great Commission covers a lot of area which Christians must exploit if they must go forward. That's why tonight we are going to do our best to dive into the Great Commission, to see how the Apostles were able to preach the Gospel. That's why most of them were from poor education background. Some of them were fishermen who were not skilled in knowledge, who were not lawyers and professors, but they end up converting lawyers, doctors, professors, people that were more educated and more vast than they were. So we are going to follow the same strategy they use and use the same strategy to try to win soul for Christ. And that is why we study the Great Commission. This topic might not be the exciting topics that many of us expect to participate in as a church. But the Great Commission is one of the key teaching ministries that every believer who wish to present his soul to Christ on the last day should participate in so that he will give you a key background on how to save life and how to express God's love not only in your family but also those who are outside your family. Remember, the Bible said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Jesus said there is only one commandment he gave to us that we should love one another even as he has loved us. By this, men we know we are his disciple. if we have love one for another. But how does this love manifest in us? It is by weakness. Because what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? So if we are called the children of God because the Father loves us, how much more Will we love our brethren enough to adopt them into God's family so that they also can be called the children of God? So this is the Great Commission. And that is the purpose why we Christians believe that this news that we are sent to preach is good news. It is not news of condemnation. It is not news of attack. It's not news of battle, it's a news of goodness, news of favor, news of blessing, telling the people how much God loves us. To the essence, he gave his holy son for our sake, that who believes and confess these sons will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is our message. And that message today is the message why you see the church is the only job the church has now until Christ return. The church was not given a different message. Neither was the church given the work of building cathedral for God. Because when Christ return, we are clear, sure, that none of those cathedrals will remain. But the only thing that can is the people we are able to present to Christ in the millennium. And that's why the Great Commission is most important than all our buildings and all our attitudes in the church. That's why it's called the Great Commission, our supreme task. That's why Christians believe evangelism is our supreme task. The only task God gave to us is to evangelize the old world, to convert people to God 
where we can't right now. Now, our key note is taken from Acts chapter 1 from verse 11. What did he say? He said, the same Jesus you have seen taken up into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go up. So, most, of, most Christians today believe that the book of Revelation should not be used as evangelizing tools for the Great Commission. But that's not true. I'm sorry to disappoint you. The Bible says if we know the wrath of God, we, we persuade men. The book of Revelation is actually given because of evangelism. It's given to our people to know that there is a punishment for evil doing and there is a reward for doing what is right. So that they can make their way now. And that's why the angels remind the disciples that the Jesus you see ascend into heaven is not going to remain permanently in heaven. In the same manner you will see him come down. The same way you see him ascend, the same way you will see him descend. And this time it's not descending because he's coming again to die. It's descending because he's coming to judge all things. To separate the sheep from the goats. And that is the reason for the second coming. So let us discuss our basic principle. What, in what way can we follow Jesus? By going around doing good. As well as preaching, speaking, teaching. See how many ways you can name. Make a list of things you can do after or on this day. In a way you feel it is good to preach the gospel. So many of us believe the hardest thing to do on earth is to preach the good news. We can go to church, listen to sermon, clap hands for the pastor, attend miracle service, attend prayer session, go to deliverance session, except only one area of the service that is most important, evangelism. Because evangelism has become the most difficult task in the history of Christian faith. Because Christians find every other thing easy except evangelizing to the poor. Some, when they are sent for evangelism, only pack flyers of the church. And when they reach there, they give to everybody they come across, come to our church. Believing that when that person comes to the church, he will hear the gospel. Why this is good form of evangelism? What of if after you hand over the flyer, the person died? There is no message in the flyer that will lead the person to heaven. There is no message in the flyer that will tell the person about Jesus Christ. That will tell him to change his life now before it is too late. But why not do it in another way? Take a piece of tract. Put your church location and address on the tract. If you are too much ashamed to speak, or do a small piece of flash drive, record a message you want to preach in evangelism on the flash drive, hand it over to 20 people, and check maybe one out of that 20 people might get home, slush in the flash drive into his player, and want to listen to what God is saying in the flash. And when he heard the voice that Jesus loved him, he will tell us about how Christ died for him. How Christ draws him to himself. That word might actually change him. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. Or a flyer. For as many that can read. And you just look at the flyer and say, well, let me just put it in the packet. So maybe sometime the Holy Spirit prompts him to just take a look at the flyer. And while he's reading, he's seeing how marvelous Christ's job was. That he died for our sake. That a friend loved us so much that he gave his life on behalf of his friend. Don't you think that flyer might actually persuade him? He may not come to church for the next three months. He may not even come to your church. But that word can keep ringing in his brain. Whenever he's walking, when he's sitting down, when he's eating, he will remember that word that you write on the flyer. And that word can change his life. That's why as a Christian, Wherever you go, don't forget to take some flyer in your pocket. Whether you are in the bus, in the train, drop the carelessly for somebody to take a look. And God help 
that fire can actually change the life. Don't assume because people carry long Bible they are Christians. Don't assume because people are in the church role, front role on Sunday, or given the title of deacon, pastor, and elders, that they have become Christian. Don't assume because people carry long cross or religious service or professors of religion and theology that they are Christian. Christianity is not in the study. It is the work of the Holy Spirit embodied in the life of a believer. It takes only God to save us. We cannot actually save ourselves. Why not try something? Meet up to pray with each other, to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Feed him or her. Everyone can be baptized with the Holy Ghost. There is no limitation to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And if you have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost, you have opportunity today to pray with us during this program and be filled with the Holy Ghost. In Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 18, it says, be, be, being filled with the Holy Ghost. That means we as believers can lay hands on each other and they will be filled with the Holy Ghost. So as believers, we have that power to lay hands on our fellow believers and fill them with the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is transferred from one life of a believer to the next life of a believer. So because we can transfer the Holy Ghost, that means our unbelieving friends, once they come to Christ, after we have saved them, we want them to join us in the work of the ministry. We can also empower them with the same Holy Ghost we have. Acts chapter 1, we discover powerful command that will help us to serve God. Minister well in the world of people. Do good. One of the actual attributes of the Christian faith is by giving. Doing good to those who are in need. In Acts 1, 1, it says that Jesus only began to do and to teach. Jesus did not only began to teach, he began to do what he teach. So you cannot just go on evangelism and say, Jesus loves you. Oh, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was on earth. He healed many sick. He raised many dead. He cast out devil. And the brother said, sorry, one of my daughter is possessed by a demon. What do you do? Do you tell him, hold on, when I come to you tomorrow, I will send for pastor, so, so, and so. He will come with me and cast out that demon. Or do you lay hand on that demon and cast him away right in that minute? And once you do that, that brother may not believe because of your word, but because of what you have done, he will believe in God. So that is why, as a believer, when you go about, you must pray. You don't just wake up in the morning and dress up for evangelism. Remember, Christ always prepared. In the daytime, he went about preaching the gospel. In the night season, he withdrew to the mountain to pray. If Christ prepared, you are not different. You are his fellow. His servant is not greater than his master. You should prepare. So when Christ draw back in the night and do his own night, in the daytime he took his Bible for evangelism. You also should do likewise. In the night, pray or fast. In the daytime, take your Bible, go for evangelism. And to teach which mean that he has not finished yet. Today, Jesus, the head walk through his body, the church. We are his hand, feet, eyes, and lips that is using to teach the gospel to the poor. Some churches only want to be lips that speaks. But Acts 10.38 says that Jesus was anointed to do good. So we are anointed to do good. Going about, healing the sick, bringing hope to those who are hopeless, casting out devil, healing all manner of disease, opening the eyes of the blind. By so doing, people will see the good work and they will believe in God and come to him on the days of visitation. So it's not what you say, it's actually what you do. Because faith comes by hearing. And here it comes from the word of God. 
when you speak it, you act it, then the people will believe it. And he shows because you are an ambassador of Christ. And you must bring the symbol of heaven and the representation of heaven to the people. They cannot see Jesus Christ. They cannot see John the Baptist. They cannot see Peter. They cannot see Paul. But they can see you. So everything they want to know about Peter, show it to them. That they may believe also, just like the way the early apostles believed because they saw Peter do wonders in the church. <clears throat> and his great love for men and women, by what he did, Jesus then explained God by what he says. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Acts chapter 1 verse 2 says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostle who he had chosen, and he make it clear that says that Jesus ministered through the Holy Ghost. So you also should not do differently. You must not minister from self. If not, nobody will listen. You must, if not, you will minister like a conservative and people will not believe in you. When your doctrine sounds so religious, people will not listen. So because of that, you must minister under the influence of the Holy Ghost. So that your gospel would make sense to the hearer. Because there is gospel for every day. You might be excellent in Bible reading. You might be good in understanding the presence of the written script. But you might not be able to witness under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the Holy Spirit. And if you are not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The people can never understand what is coming from your mouth. Why is this so important? When Jesus came to the earth as a baby, he left all his divine power in heaven. We can get that in Philippians 2 verse 7. When he spoke and did miracles, he did so as a man, not as God, who knew how to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that men today can also do the same work that he did. Even greater one for the same power of the Holy Spirit as we see in John 14 verse 12. So, do you now understand that today you can do exactly the same work that Christ did? Because even Christ himself said to us, all these things you see me do, Greater things than this shall ye do also. Do you know why? Because I go to my Father. Now, the Holy Spirit empowered you. Why would the Holy Spirit empower you? In verse 8, Jesus said, They would receive dunamis or explosive power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. From dunamis, we can get powerful words like dynamo or dynamite, authority. Even the delegated authority God gives is impotent unless it can be enforced. No matter how spiritually powerful, how you can speak in many tongues, you may even speak in tongues of men, in tongues of angels, and you can even write in song, compose song in tongues, write a letter to your wife or children in tongues, but accept you can enforce it. It's useless. Your tongues mean nothing to anybody. If you are just speaking, it become like noise making because it does not edify. The only way the tongues of the Holy Spirit can edify you is when you bring it to life by the work of God in you. And that is when the power of the Holy Spirit in you can edify. The Holy Spirit do not miss is that ability to demonstrate the authority we already have inside. Remember too how the disciples all ran away when Jesus was arrested. They were filled with the Holy Spirit but they ran away because they have not received dunamis. The ability to demonstrate the power that is inside. To bring the reality of Christ's message into the physical. 
When you lack that say ability, when you see somebody in the village with cutlass, you will go and hide. Because you have not received dunamis. But when you receive dunamis, you will stand and speak in the middle of battle. And your enemy will bow themselves to you. I want to give you an instance how dunamis operate. We were in a mission in a small village in Ebba. A man was smoking in their hand. And his hand, he was, and I look at the man, his head was not even, he met, was mentally unstable. Plus in their hand, and I knew this would hurt his head. The first act I did as a Christian was to take away the Indian hand from him and throw it away. Then the man grew angry, picked up a cutlass and said he was going to take off my head. And the Holy Spirit said, begin to weakness. While he was raising cutlass, people spread away from me, but I continued to weakness. But suddenly, the cutlass dropped from him and he gave his life to Christ. That means God can speak to you in respect of your situation. So why am I saying this to you? That the Holy Spirit, if he's active in you, he directs your steps. He directs your language. Because the Bible says when you are brought before a cloud of weakness, you should not think of what to say, act or do. Whatever is given you at that point, you should say. Because the dunamis in you will speak the word of God on your behalf. So your word cannot be wrong. Your word cannot infuriate. Your word will minister grace and peace to the hearer. And by so doing, their life will be won for Christ. So in Acts chapter 2 verse 14 onward. Acts chapter 2 verse 14 onward. What does it say? It said this all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his bedroom. What is it telling us? It takes unity for the church to overcome the devil. You no, know, sometimes I go to African churches and I discover a lot of churches are busy killing the devil that is not going to die. And the question is, why are you wasting your energy killing the devil that you know fully well from the scripture that no amount of prayer you pray is going to kill the devil because he's not going to die. And he's not going to retire. In fact, the more you kill him, the more he's going to oppress you. So, and I now ask myself, why is the devil the problem to many churches? I discover because the church refused to unite. Because if the church is united, the Bible says the gate of hell will not prevail against the church. But if the church refused to unite the home one force, evangelizing the old world, the gates of hell will prevail against the church. And for the devil to be overtaken or overthrown, the church must come under unity of doing one work. We may be many names, denominations, whatever you call it, but we must be one in evangelism. We must understand that it is not him that planted his anything, Neither is he that watereth anything, but the one that gave the increase, and that is Christ. That no matter how many members we are in one body, that the head is Christ. And until we understand that we are all united under Christ, we cannot do the devil anything. But God told us, upon this church, rock of unity and faith, he will build his church. That the gate of hell will not prevail against this church. He is not talking about building. He is talking about the people of God who comes with one mind to liberate sinners and to rescue the world from the hand of Satan and all the host of demons out there. And when we are able to do that, then the gate of hell will not prevail against us. The purpose of the Holy Spirit comes for one reason. To witness with power that Jesus is still alive. That is the only reason why you receive the Holy Spirit. If you speak the tongues that you can even write song with tongues, and there is no power in it, you are a noise maker. And if you are in my church, I drive you out. Be witness. What is a witness? 
Supposed to truck crash and the driver are fighting. The police says, Who saw this? They want witnesses. And a witness only has to say what he saw. And how are you going to say what you saw about the events that happened 2,000 years ago when you are less than 50 years? The Holy Spirit. So for you to be witness about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, it takes only the Holy Spirit who was there before the baptism of John. Before the day Jesus was born, even when the wise men came, the one that witnessed it, the one that confirmed to you that everything written in the scripture is true, and that is the Holy Spirit. Without Him, your weakness cannot be true. And that's why you need Him. I believe many Christians today will tell you we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, you don't believe the Word of God. Because your Word of God in your mouth cannot be confirmed without the Holy Spirit. Witness only says what they saw. He gave no opinion of what happened before. Make no judgment who is right or who is wrong. He only says what is, I see. This is what I see happen. And he is not responsible for what happened next. Whether this man is guilty or not guilty is none of his business. That is the job of the judge. But a witness job is to say, I see this car was coming from the right, and the other one was coming from the left. The one coming from the right refused to stop. He hit the other man that was coming from the left. That is his job. And his job is finished. It is not left for the police or the judge to make the determination, not for the witness. So the same thing you are as a witness of Christ. It is not your job to name the people that will go to hell or the list of people that will end up in heaven. That is not your job. Or what you saw in the vision. How we are asleep, you see this man in hellfire. You saw the other one in heaven. That is none of your job as a witness. Your job as a witness is to say what you have seen and your job end there. And when you say what you see, it is left for God to do the conviction. It is not even your job to save life. You cannot draw any man to God. Only God can draw people to himself. When you say what you see, you end there. It is not your job to make your ministry popular or to become 100 million viewers on YouTube or Facebook. That is not your job. God said when you lift him on high, he will draw men to himself. That is the job of God. It is not your job. If he refuse to draw, if God decides to draw one man to himself, that is God's business. It's not your own. That's why when Peter asked Jesus, what about this man? Peter feed my sheep. Peter feed my lamb. Peter feed my dish. What about this man? Is he not also your friend? What would John will he do? Jesus said, if I like, let that man remain alive until I come. What is that to do? If, if I like, let that man remain alive until I come. What is that to you, Peter? You do the work I sent you. And I am saying the same to you as a believer today. Do the work God sent you. Whatever he did not send you, leave it. Don't do more than what God sent you to do. If God like, let those people remain until he come. He know how to fix it. It is not your responsibility. It is not your job to know who is a prostitute and who is a, is a saint. Or who is a Christian and who is an unbeliever. That is not your job. Your job is to correct, to teach, to reprove with sound doctrine. Your job is not to judge any man. It's not to condemn any man. Leave judgment to God. He has appointed a day of judgment where he will judge the quick and the dead. That is not your job. And he told us, upon his willingness to testify, what happened in futures? Freedom. Captivity of a man. That is the job of a witness also. He's ready to testify. You will call him and say, oh, did you see what happened in this accident? He said, yes. Okay. Can you come to the court so, so and so day to testify that you saw these things? This man hit this man from the right or from the left. He said, yes. That is where the job of a witness ends. And being a witness is responsible job that we have seen, we have been given to do. So God calls us, no matter the call you have, whether you are called as apostle, you are called as an evangelist, you are called as a pastor, or you are called as a prophet, or as a healer, 
you are called to witness to Christ. So let your job stop there. What have we seen? We have seen Jesus working in us, forgiving, healing, and blessing. But we have a lot to say. The Holy Spirit then walked through the walk, persuading men and women that what we say is true. If they believe and accept Jesus, they are free. If not, they remain in captivity to sin and to Satan. That is all the message. Where do we go and tell our story? We have been assigned a part of God's vineyard to walk in. You have a specific location that God gave to every man. God cannot send you to everywhere on earth at the same time. As he's sending you, don't believe you are the only one he is sending. He's sending millions of people. As he's sending you, he's sending B, he's sending C. So do your part. Let the other do his part. And God's work will be finished in no time. You cannot do all. You can only do your part. Don't run more than you can. If not, you will fall into the hand of the devil. In Jerusalem, there are people appointed to Jerusalem. Most people tell the story in their Jerusalem. We stand for their home. The people that speak their language, their villages, their town. The same people that they dress the same, they have the same culture, they have the same voices. So in CGF, we always prefer to use Jerusalem as our typical mission ground because one is less expensive. By using people within the same locality to preach to the same people of the same locality, you save more income because they speak the same language. You don't need a translator. So, but it's more difficult because you have to train people within that particular locality to be able to carry out mission within that, within their Jerusalem. And that's why it is more effective way in ministry. And the people are more keen with trust to listen. But you also spend more money because you have to train missionary and keep retraining them. And this is an effective method, but it requires excessive training. In Luke chapter 8, verse 39. The next point is Samaria. Samaria might also represent those within the same provinces, nearby provinces, where people are similar, but a different dialect or prejudice. This also requires training of missionaries within that particular provinces, to be able to cover particular provinces within a particular locality. This also helps us to reach out to those who are far away by sending missionaries to learn their tongues and be able to train people who speak different language within that particular locality. We will be able to reach them more effectively. Jerusalem method is more easier to implement but also more expensive to train more missionaries to be able to implement the Jerusalem method of operation. So that is why in CGF we always prefer Jerusalem method of operation because it helps us to be more embedded into the community. And by so doing, people may not notice your work in the town, but the word of God is going on on the ground. Even the end of the earth, and this is more difficult because it requires a lot of fun, because you are no longer in the day of Abraham or Jesus. So people now who want to go from Africa to Europe for the gospel, we need a visa. And now if you want to go from Africa to Asia, you will need a visa. If you want to go from Asia to America, you will need a visa. If you want to go from America to India, you will need a visa. So because of that, and apart from needing a visa, you need a flight ticket. And apart from needing a flight ticket, you need accommodation. And you need food. You need clothes. So that's why this part of the gospel is becoming more difficult for Christians, except for rich ministers. So there are also ways of facilitating this. Making your voice heard so that you can be invited to a church in that location. So that when you speak to the church in that location, you will use the opportunity to come in. But it depends on how it is implemented. 
it might not work effectively because most of the churches are in town, not in the village where the gospel are needed. So by so doing, it is more difficult to use this method. But today we are in the world of social media where anything is possible. If you can hook up with somebody that speaks English in India or in Afghanistan or in Pakistan and you are able to convert him to God, you can use him to form a team that will take on his local community without you going to Pakistan. And by so doing, you reduce the cost. But then you have to spend a lot of resource and time in training such a missionary to effectively do his job. That is how to manage ministry in the ends of the earth. And that's why God told us that this gospel covers also the ends of the earth, different once they tell the people that Jesus is alive. And that is your message. Tell them that Jesus that was dead is risen, and now that is alive, and is coming again to judge both the quick and the dead. The work, work with urgency. Don't relax. Oh, if I don't do it today, tomorrow is another day. It's not always tomorrow. Because you don't know what day will break. Because the Bible says sufficient for each day is the evil thereof. So, we must do our job with urgency until Jesus come again. As the angel promised, he would do. He would in powerful message. See in Acts chapter 1 verse 11. Say that we will see Jesus coming down again. So we don't know when he is coming down. He never told us the day he is coming down. So because he did not tell us, we have to do it fast. So that we will not come and meet that we have not finished it. Because he told us we must not have finished all the cities in Israel before he returned. So we want to finish the whole cities on earth before he returned. So we have to be very fast. So the work of God or the mission is something that requires urgency. And so believers must take it to heart and must be fast about it. Let's get one thing straight. Today we might have a church with one point something million members. It is only the pastor that takes the glory. Because none of those members has made one convert to the church. And so because they have not done so, they don't have any soul to present to God on the last day. Let us assume we have one million missionaries. Do you know how many cities can be saved by one million missionaries? So it is better to train 10 missionaries than to have 1 million members. Because if you have 10 missionaries, they can save 100,000 people. But if you have 10 million members, you might not be able to save 10. Because they might not actually go for evangelism. They will only come to church on Sunday and relax with their Bible to listen to how cool your Sabbath was. How the pastor can dance. How he can demonstrate. How many people we are healed in the service. Without taking the gospel to other people themselves. We will talk about when that might be little later on. Many signs tell us that his return may be soon. Now is the time to pray and to win our family and friends to Jesus. Because none of us will want on the last day to be with Christ in paradise. While our families and friends will be cast into the utter darkness. But we will want where we are for our family, brothers and sisters to also be there. That's why this message should not only be for your consultation and consummation. You should also present it to your friends, brothers, sisters, relatives, fathers, mothers. So that they will also hear the truth and change their life of godliness. So that they will not be cast into the utter darkness. When he comes next time, it will not be as a baby, but as a Lord and King to reign for a thousand years. Jesus will put his word right with truth, justice, before winding up human history by creating a new heaven and a new earth. So, make Jesus Lord and King. It is important. In Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus spent 40 days teaching his disciples all about the kingdom of God. Christ has already prepared us for that kingdom because he teaches us for 40 days how the kingdom looks. The kingdom means dominion 
rule of a king. So, wherever Jesus is Lord, the righteous rule of God comes in. Lives, family, churches, even the whole village are changed when Jesus is made king and has his ways among them. So, brethren, let us understand that when we praise the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. If God's will is being done on earth, that means all the crime we see in our society will cease. Because in heaven there is no crime. In heaven there is no poverty. In heaven there is no frustration. In heaven there is no sin. In heaven there is no rich man, no poor man. We are a servant of God. Glory. Riches, joy every day. There is no sorrow. There is no tears. So that is why we want his kingdom to come. That's why we want his rule, to, his will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Pray together and pray without ceasing. We must understand as believers that the battle is not secure until we reach heaven. So while we are on earth, there are so many forces that will be battling to take us out of the way, to lead us astray so that we will not mix up with our heavenly mansion. So, we must pray always. First, we must pray for ourselves by putting on the whole armor of God so that we will be able to, so that we will be able to overcome the evil days. And we must also pray for others and especially for us so that we may have boldness to speak the word of God without shame, without fear or respect of person. The first thing that believer did on that first day without Jesus was to restore communication with him through prayer. Acts chapter 1 verse 12. He said, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. In verse 13, and when they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Ephesus, and Simeon, Zealot, Judah, the brother of James. All these continued one and called in prayer and supplication with men and women. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, they were all in prayer. So what are you doing today? Do you have time for personal prayer for the saints? Praying for the ministry? Intercessory prayer? Or is your prayer only for yourself? 365 days a year, you are praying for your prosperity. Praying for God bless you. God prosperity. Did you have time to pray for the ministry? Do you know there are a world of people out there that are saying within their heart, I do not know if God has a son, or what is his name, or who is it that gathered water in the hollows of his hand, who is it that has sailed into heaven, or that has descended into hell. If you know, please tell me, what is his name, what is his son's name. They are asking you to please tell them. Do you pray for those people? Or all you care about is for yourself. Your family, you are saved. So what? I am going to heaven. You don't care whether your family member perishes in hell. You don't care whether your mother or sisters or brothers end up in hell. Is that the kind of Christian you are? The Bible says you are a wicked servant. If all you care about, the talent you received since you, since you came to Christ, you went and buried it on the ground so that you will not use it for God. You say on the last day I will dig it up. I will give to God that which is God. God said you are a wicked servant. He will show you with the hypocrites. But this time is time for you not only to pray for yourself. You must take your sons, your daughter, through prayer to God. You must take your family members through prayer to God. You must take your sister, your brother, your father, your relative, your distant friend, your church member, that brother that fought you on the street for no reason. You must take them to God through prayer. So that God can draw them to himself. 
Remember, if somebody fought him yesterday for nothing, and today his life is changed, he will no longer fight you. He may not see you next time, both of you will become friends. Even though he once slapped you last week, because now he has become a new creature. All things in his life has passed away. So instead of busy taking offenses, because offenses, as long as you are head, offenses must surely come. Instead of taking offenses in the world, take time to pray. Take time to preach to them. Not only to pray, also take time to visit them. Teach them the word of God. And by so doing, you will be able to change them for the better. And next time, their character will be changed towards you. You will be happy. You will also enjoy the benefits. From Act 1, 12 to 15, tells us that the disciples, the men, the women, brethren of Jesus, were united as one. So when you also pray, pray as a group. Come together as a team of your evangelism team, your outreach team, your mission team, pray together. That's why in CGF, the last Tuesday of every month, from 11.30 to 12.30, we spend it in prayer together as a team. Hoping that anybody that is partaking to it, having any issue, bring it to the group and we pray together. The Bible says the fervent and the effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. So, the mother of Jesus was there as an intercessor, taking to her son through prayer. Mary did not sit down saying, I'm already saved. She was also talking to her son through prayer. So, you also should learn to act like Mary. She did not say, it's my son, so I don't need to pray to God. My son is there. He will help me whenever I'm in trouble. No, he went to God through prayer. So you also should do likewise. From Luke chapter 24, verse 49, we know that their prayer was, Come Holy Spirit, empower us. Come Holy Spirit, empower us. This should be the prayer of the saint. When you don't know what to do, when you are confused and you don't have the strength or weakness, don't give up. Say to God, Come Holy Spirit, empower us. In Acts chapter 2, they received a mighty answer. And that was dunamis. The power explosion of the Holy Spirit came and the roof was shaking. And the men hear them speaking in their own languages, testifying of the goodness of God. What about today? You are surprised. You speak. People of different languages begin to hear you testify of the goodness of God in their local diet. Don't you think they will return to God and give their life to Christ rather than confront you in battle? If you don't pray, people will fight you. But if you pray, people will stop fighting you and believe in God. So that's why as a Christian, instead of complaining of how many enemies are against you, be busy praying for them so that God can change them, they will no longer fight you. In Acts chapter 1, 15 and 26, shows that the disciple replaced Judas with another who knew Jesus was alive. Judas took the session fell, but they did not rely, oh, when Christian fall, we want to do everything to restore such a believer. When it becomes impossible for us to restore one of our lost brother or a believer who has fallen or died in the field, we replace him with somebody else that knows that Jesus is alive. And by so doing, the work of God continues. We don't allow anybody that falls in the battlefield to slow our battle down. We continue. We press forward for the mark of the higher calling in Christ Jesus. That's why there is no unique leaders in the ministry. In the mission, we fight on. Even when the leader falls, the next person takes over. And that is how the battles continue. Not one leader must be missing. People need direction. And their spiritual and natural energy harness for the gospel. If one that can heal is missing, and when somebody else that has the gift of healing to replace him. If one that is, can prophesy is missing from the church, and when somebody else that has the gift of prophecy to replace him, don't allow one leader to be missing. So if God is challenging you to rise and take responsibility in the work, say yes to him, and even today, and you will see the wonders God will do in your life.
So, by so doing, let's read Acts. Acts chapter 1 from verse 14. It says, All this continue with one accord in prayer, supplication with the women, mainly the mother of Jesus and his brethren. 15 says, In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The numbers of the names, according to which were about a hundred and twenty. 120 people were gathered in the upper room and they received from God and they hear from God. And that 120 people, men and brethren, the scripture needs have been fulfilled. And the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spoke before concerning Judas. Because Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve. And this also goes back to the Old Testament when Elijah gather all the children of Israel in Mount Carmel. And he discovered that it is time for God to send rain. What did he do? He first of all repaired the altar of God that has been broken. When you want to go out for the ministry, evangelism is like a battle. You are going there to save lives from the hands of the devil. And you don't just go with empty hands. You have to repair your altar. Check the altar that has been broken down in your life. Check every area. Met those altars. And what did Elijah do first? He discovered that the altar of God has been broken. He built it up. He repaired the altar. He did not build new one. Don't say, oh, ah, my salvation life is not tattered. So I will just start afresh. No. Repair that which has been broken down. That was what Elisha did. What Elijah did on Mount Carmel, he repaired the altar. And after he has repaired the altar, he made sure when he was repairing the altar, he was deliberate. The number of the tribe of Israel, the twelve stones which make up the twelve tribe of Israel, each stone for each tribe, he used it to build the bridges. And after that, he set the bullock in the altar. And he gathered some wood. And beyond that, he added faith to it by pouring more water. When you know that it takes kerosene to catch fire, but water was used in replacement of kerosene. To demonstrate that God can do the impossible. And so the same way when you are preparing for your evangelism, or you are preparing your team, your team to go out for mission, first, gather them together. Just like the disciples did. When they gathered the team together, they fasted. And when they have prayed, they said, the Holy Spirit spoke through David concerning Judah. What happened to Judah? Judah represents the broken wall that has been broken down from the 12 tribes of Israel. It represents the lost one who said, time through deception has taken away. And because of that, he was numbered with the disciples. He was with them when Christ was on earth. He was numbered among them. His place and his office need be fulfilled for the Holy Spirit to come down. So if for God to come down in your life, the bridges that have been broken down must be fixed. So if you must prepare for the Great Commission, you must fix the bridges. Those bridges in your life that the enemy has destroyed, you must assemble them together as one. And when you have done with that, just like they did with Judah, and they guide them that was to Jesus, and he was no part with us, and has obtained a part of this ministry. And now this man purchased a feed with the reward of his iniquity, falling headlong in, in the midst, burst asunder in the midst. And all his bow had gushed out, and it was known unto all that dwell in Jerusalem, insomuch that the feed is called in their proper tongue Akidamia, which is being interpreted the feed of blood. And it is written in the book of Psalm, let its inhabitation be what? Desolate. 
and let no man dwell therein. And his bishop branch let another take. So, if one of you have true deception falling from the church, restore such a one. If you cannot restore, give his position to another man. Because the Bible said, his bishop branch let another man take. And gather your team together, unite them in unity and one bond. Before you pray for five minutes, the Holy Spirit will fall. But if you do not unite them together, it will be almost impossible. You might pray for 42 years, the Holy Spirit will not come down. And that's what the Apostle did, and the Holy Spirit came down. So, brethren, this is where we draw the curtain for today's teaching. God bless you as you listen. So, if you enjoy this teaching, you want to participate, every Tuesday, the time is 7 p.m. every Tuesday. It's known as CGF Open House Fellowship, where we teach you about the principle of serving the Lord through the work of the mission. And it is a non-denominational fellowship where every member from every denomination can participate and learn how to bring the gospel to the poor and to share the good news in their very field of endeavor. God bless you. My name that is the teacher for tonight is Missionary Collins. We would like to hear from you about your testimony, about your prayer for us, and we also want you to participate in this service. If you want to listen to our subsequent message, you can go to cgfnslogin.app cgfnslogin.app or campus.cgf.app if you want to study any of our Bible-related courses where you can actually train to become a missionary or minister whatever you desire in your life. God bless you. I will be happy to hear from you. Let us pray. Before we pray, we have heard that Christ gave us only one job, to save the lost. And if you are willing to save the lost today, you are welcome to join us. Go to our website, fill out the form. We will get in touch with you so that we can also participate in saving the lost. Or setting up a fellowship close to your house where you can train your own team of missionaries that you can use to reach out to your local community. God bless you as you do this. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your children who have heard, who want and are ready to participate in sharing the gospel. Lord, release your Holy Spirit into their life. Fill them with dunamis. Holy Spirit, come down in the mighty power, in the mighty glory, possess them from the sole of their head to the sole of their feet. Give them the boldness to witness for you. Release your authority in the life of every believer hearing this gospel. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you have heard this word, I believe the Holy Spirit has been released into your life. Go now. Start. Remember the Holy Spirit is not in the feeling, it's not in emotion. The Holy Spirit can only be active if you actually obey the instruction by moving out to teach the gospel. God bless you as you go. Amen.